Hey everyone, I have no idea why I didn't make this video before. Uh, it's pretty challenging stuff. So um, here I am. Uh, I was wrong. I should have done this before. Uh, we started to do number 13 in class and decided it was a bit uh, time consuming to do, but now we'll do it. Okay. Um, so. Just as a reminder, uh, things that are useful for us when we're graphing are points of inflection. Um, so we could kind of put this stuff over here just as a reminder. Points of inflection, that's helpful. We know that we switch from concave up, or sorry, concave down to concave up at a point of inflection, or we might switch, you know, vice versa, concave up to concave down. Um, let's see, uh, extrema. Extrema, maximum, and minimum. Right, it's useful to know: Do we uh, have a peak here? Do we have a, a valley here? At some point, so it's useful to know the extrema. It's useful to know x-intercepts. It's useful to know vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, uh, slant asymptotes. Okay, and just a side note, horizontal asymptotes, you got to have slant asymptotes, you got to have quadratic asymptotes, you got to have cubic asymptotes. Um, it all depends on, first you have to have a rational function, um, and then if they are the, the same, or the, by the same I mean the degree is the same, or the degree of the denominator is greater, you're going to have a horizontal asymptote. If uh, the numerator is greater by a de one degree, then you'll have a slant. If it's greater by two degrees, you'll have a, a quadratic. By three degrees, you'll have a cubic. When you divide the, nu the numerator by the denominator, if you wind up, you know, whatever um, non-remainder part you wind up with, that'll be your asymptote. Sometimes that'll be zero, sometimes that'll be a number, sometimes that'll be a line, sometimes that'll be a uh, quadratic. And I'm going to stop talking about that now. Okay. Um, and also, uh, you know, it's useful just in general to know concavity. Um, so just little pieces here and there, tools we're going to use to graph uh, this stuff. So um, basically we want to pull all the information we can out of the function, out of the derivative, and out of the second derivative. Um, so the original function could tell us um, uh, most universally we would look at, to try and find x-intercepts. So we would take the function Set it equal to zero. Um, you know, if uh, it's kind of easy to look at if you subtract x on both sides, just to see what we're doing here. Trying to get rid of this denominator so we could multiply by x squared plus one on both sides, and we cancel out here. We get four equals negative x to the third. Mm, minus x, so we could have x to the third plus x plus four equals zero. And I'm not sure what the uh, book authors had in mind, but uh, there there are no simple rational. When I by simple I mean rational rational zeros for this. So uh, let me make this a little smaller, fit in the screen here. Um, we can just pull this in, and we could, sorry, it looks a little bit uh, blocky, the resolution's a little bad. So, um, we could put this function in there and get uh, x to the third um, plus x plus four, All right, and we could uh, graph it, and then realize that this window is terrible. And zoom six, that's the standard viewing window. There we see a zero, and we could uh, second calc a zero. Start on the left of the zero. There we go. Go to the right of the zero. And guess, yes, the zero is somewhere in there. And we see it's negative 1.38. So um, there you go. Um, x equals negative 1.38. Eight. Okay. Uh, so the thing is, if if I were to write a calculus textbook, uh, I wouldn't have this be 
a zero, but that happens. Um, so anyway, there's uh, there is well we found x right, and and we found x uh, from from this being equal to zero. That came from this. Came from this. Um, well, that was when we set the function equal to zero. So we must have found an x-intercept. Okay. Um, we could also look at vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes just uh, are a possible thing that could happen when the function is undefined. Uh, there could be a hole or a vertical asymptote or maybe some other kind of weirdness. Um, so I, th I would think that most often that, that those things would be vertical asymptotes. So what would cause this function to be undefined? Well, the denominator being 0 would cause it to be undefined. If that happened, that would be uh, bad, and we'd probably have a vertical asymptote, if not a hole or something. So x squared equals negative 1, and we should see that this isn't possible. Uh, you know, that's what we would have, plus or minus i. We, we want real numbers. We want to graph this on the real um, Cartesian plane, not with imaginary numbers. So uh, that's out. There's no vertical asymptotes. There's no uh, place where this function is undefined. Um, so we continue on from there. We've gathered all the information we can from g. So uh, we'll just grab another color and we'll look at g prime and look at all the information we can get from g prime. Um, first we have to find g prime. g prime, the de derivative of x is 1 plus, OK. Here's how I look at this. It's, uh, it's 4 times x squared plus 1 plus 1 to the negative 1. That way, uh, I don't have the quotient rule. I just have a pretty simple chain rule situation. So uh, bring the the exponent down. So we get negative 4 plus a negative 4 times uh, x squared plus 1 uh, to the negative 2 times the derivative of the inside. That's 2x. Okay, we can simplify this a little bit. 1 plus, I shouldn't have put plus, I should have said minus, minus, uh, we got the, the 4 and the 2x in the numerator, this negative uh, exponent, we'll put this guy in the denominator, so we can call this 8x over x squared plus 1 squared, and if you did uh, the quotient rule, you'd come out with the same thing. Um, so there's the, there's the, um, the derivative, and the derivative tells us things about the slope. And the slope is uh, a useful thing to know, especially when it's zero, because then we know uh, we might possibly have a maximum or a minimum. So we'll set this guy equal to zero and solve for x. So how about 8x over x squared plus 1 squared equals 1, and then we'll multiply by the denominator on both sides, and we'll get 8x equals x squared plus 1 squared. Um, and then we'll get 8x equals x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. Uh, then we'll get x to the fourth minus, uh, no, we'll just have 2x squared minus 8x plus 1 equals 0. And then we would try and find the zeros of this function as well. Um, but the, there's, we can't factor by grouping. That doesn't work. Um, we could try the, try the rational zero test, but I just have some foreknowledge that that would be a waste of time. So let's just go to the calculator again. Uh, so we'll go in here. We'll clear out. Uh, uh, well, actually, we could just not have it graph that. If you go over to the equal sign and, and press enter and, and have it not be highlighted, it just won't graph that function, but we can have it in there. Um, so now we'll graph this. Talk amongst yourselves. Or you could be doing this along with me. OK, and then we can graph it. You can see there's a couple zeros there. Can calculate those zeros. That's the left and the right, and I guess so. One of the zeros is 
So x equals 0.129. Uh, let's find the other. Uh, again, second calc at 0. Move over here, that's good. Move to the right. And the other 0 looks like 1.608. All right, um, so there we go. We'll get rid of that. So these two guys, what I, you know, it's it's good to uh, to go back and and be sure you know what these are, right? So we go back, and this was set equal to zero. It goes all the way back to the derivative was set equal to zero. So these are maybe extrema, and possibly or, or, or probably they are extrema, but uh, they're possible extrema right now, right? Because these are the places where the slope is horizontal. And keep in mind that the graph we were just looking at is the graph of the derivative, not of this function. Okay, um, So you may be thinking, like, well, on the graph, it wasn't a zero slope here and here. Um, but it was a, that was the graph of the derivative. And this would have a, a flat spot on it. So does it mean that it's it, it has a, a maximum or a minimum? Or it could just come up like this, flatten out, and go up like that, So or, or this way. So we need to investigate those. Um, what else can the derivative tell us? Um, um, nothing. It can only tell us about extrema, really, um, at this point. So um, no, I want just a different color. That's all I want. So now we'll look at f double prime, or g double prime, excuse me, g double prime. Um, I should write that a little further down. So g double prime of x, just the derivative of the derivative. Um, yeah, we're just going to go right here. And the derivative of 1 is 0, so uh, the derivative of this guy, we're going to use the, 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 uh, the quotient rule here. So uh, low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below if you like that. Um, so we'll take this to be a negative 8x. So um, the derivative of negative 8x is negative 8 times just the denominator minus uh, just uh, you know this numerator by itself. So that's negative 8x. So that causes this to be a positive 8x times the derivative of this. So this would be Two, got to use the chain rule on this thing. Two times x squared plus one to the first power uh, times the derivative of the inside. That's two x, and that's what's being multiplied by eight x. All over the square of what's below x squared plus one to the fourth. So let's clean this up a little bit. Um, so we have negative 8 times x squared plus 1 squared. Um, let's see. Got 8x times 2 times 2x. So we've got 32x squared. Times x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 1 to the fourth. Okay, at this point we may as well just go ahead and say, well, obviously we would like to set this equal to zero. We'd like to do that with, with all of these things. Um, so, and it will only matter as long as the numerator is equal to zero, the whole function, or the whole uh, fraction here will be equal to zero, unless, of course, the denominator happens to be zero, which will never happen. So, we should be good to go. We'll set this. Not just that, but this whole thing equal to zero. Um, then we'll have negative eight times x to the fourth plus two x squared plus one um, plus we got thirty two x to the fourth Um, plus 32x squared equals 0. And then we have negative 8x to the fourth 
minus uh, 16x squared minus 8 plus 32x to the fourth plus 32x squared equals 0. So we have 32x to the fourth minus 8x to the fourth. Um, so we have um, 24x to the fourth. And uh, 32x squared minus 16x squared, that's 16x squared. Um, making sure everything's getting worked in here. Minus 8 equals 0. Of course, you could divide this all by 8 and get 3x to the fourth plus 2x squared minus 1. Um, now, this is in quadratic form. You might be able to factor this. Um, bring that over here. Just a thought. Of course, one of these would have to be 3x squared, and this would have to be x squared. And we have to get a negative 1. So how about a plus 1 and a minus 1? Um, so x squared plus 1 and 3x squared minus 1. We get 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. 1 times 3 is 3. x squared minus x squared. That's 2x squared. And we get 3x to the fourth. So that did work. Perhaps that's why they chose such a strange function, because the second derivative happens to give us uh, nice zeros. So if we set this guy equal to 0 and solve for x, we've got x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 third. Um, here we'll find that x is equal to plus or minus i. Of course, we don't need to know those things, because that's imaginary, and that's not useful to us. So at x equals plus or minus one-thirds, we have uh, the second derivative equal to zero, which gives us possible points of inflection, right? Because if, if it escapes you uh, why that is, it's really important that you, uh, well, it's much more powerful that you understand that uh, rather than not. So um, a point of inflection is where we switch concavity, uh, like from here, or, or this, for example, switches from a, uh, a concave up, which is a positive second derivative, to concave down, which is a negative second derivative, everywhere that is concave up, the second derivative is positive. Everywhere that is concave down, the second derivative is negative. So right in between those two concavities uh, has to be a second derivative of zero. And so that's why we set the second derivative equal to zero. Um, and here we go, plus or minus the square root of one third. Um, at 0.129 and 1.608, we have possible extrema. Uh, here at, um, at nowhere, because they're imaginary numbers, uh, we have x-intercepts, so we actually don't have any x-intercepts. Uh, or, sorry, this was uh, vertical asymptotes. Should have underlined these or something, right? No vertical asymptotes, but we do have um, an x-intercept. Last thing we could do is we could uh, ask ourselves what happens to this function as x goes to infinity. Um, you know, we could also get the uh, horizontal or slant asymptote information out of this thing. Well, this part is going to go to zero, and this part will become more and more, you know, standing alone as x becomes larger and larger. So as x gets larger, the more and more this function just looks like x, and not x plus four over x squared plus one. This will be so small it'll be like you just put in. Uh, a million and get out pretty much a million. Um, you're going to add on a little bit more, but just not that much more. So it's pretty much just like x. Um, so we do have a slant asymptote. Uh, slant asymptote at y equals x. All right. So now comes the part where we take all this information, and we put it into that little chart, uh, and apply it. So that's what we'll try and do. And of course, uh, this, this little sketch is really, really small. So uh, bear with me as I try to cram this into this small space. Um, so our little chart will just start uh, with some value of x, and we'll look at f of x, and we'll look at f prime. And look at f, f double prime. You know, when all these things uh, are relevant, sometimes they will be and sometimes they won't be. And then we'll draw some kind of a conclusion based on what we've found.
Okay, so um, let's say we, we go from negative infinity all the way up until our first value of interest. We have values at uh, negative 1.38, at uh, 0.129, uh, 1.608, neg po positive and negative square root of one-third. Uh, all of these points are, are x values that we may be interested in. So um, which one comes first is the question. Well, it's going to be negative, right? Um, negative 1.38 or negative square root of one-third. Uh, those are your two choices. So what's going to be more to the left, square root of one-third, neg negative square root of th one-third, or negative 1.38? Well, definitely negative 1.38. So we come up on negative 1.38. Um, and f of x on this interval, um, it, we, we really don't say anything about it, right? Usually what we say about f of x is that it is worth 2 or 0 or 5 or, you know, some number. But on this interval, it's not really doing anything. Um, what's f of f prime of x doing? Um, well, we could look at that uh, and find out if it's positive or negative, and see if it's increasing or decreasing. So we could just go ahead and do that. So at negative, um, or on that interval from negative infinity to negative 1.38. Um, so like at negative two, we could put that into the first derivative, right here, right. So negative two, we would have. Uh, uh, negative 2 times negative 8, that'd be positive 16 over, this is 4 plus 1, that's 5, then we squared, that's 25, so 16 over 25, 1 minus 16 over 25, um, or 1 plus 16 over 25 is going to be positive, so that's all I really care about is that it is positive, okay? Um, and here we could look at the second derivative and see if it's positive or negative. Um, so we, uh, let's see, did we clean this up much, we come over here, negative 2 squared, that's going to be 4, we get 5, we square, we get 25 times negative 8, right, and to pull out the big guns here, so 25 times negative 8, it'll be negative 200, um, plus uh, 32 times 4, Right, that's right here, times, uh, this will be 4 plus 1, that's going to be 5, so multiply that by 5. And then we're going to divide that by uh, 4 plus 1, that's going to be, well, it's going to be uh, pretty big, 25 to the 4th. Right, but we can see that this is going to be positive, and that's all that really matters. Um, so, let's see. Put that away. So the second derivative is positive. Uh, okay, and the conclusion is that it must be increasing in concave up. Uh, so concave up. And that's what's going on on the interval, and now we will look at the next part of the chart, that'd be where we actually are at the value of negative 1.38. Okay, so what is interesting about that? Well, we found that to be an x-intercept. That's because the function, the original function, is 0. Um, we could say the, um, the original, not the original, the first derivative, uh, it hasn't gotten to a, a possible extrema yet, so it must still be positive. Right? It's got to be positive until it comes along and it possibly uh, you know, turns around. Uh, so um, it's got to still be positive until 0.129, possibly. So then we come along the, uh, the second derivative. It's also still got to be positive, still concave up. So really the thing, the important thing, is that there's an x-intercept right there. It goes through the x-axis. Um, then from negative 1.38 until uh, the next value, which is the only other negative value, that would be the negative square root of one-third. Sorry, this is so cramped. So on that interval, um, we're not really going to say anything about 
the original function. Um, we could say that the first derivative is positive. We could look at the second derivative and say, oh, that's the, that's the interesting part. Uh, it's zero, okay? Is it a, is it a point of inflection is, is what we're asking ourselves. Well, it depends. Uh, a point of inflection happens when you switch concavity. So do we switch concavity? We don't know. Um, we need to look, let's see, I, I do this often. This is on an interval. So interval, uh, on this interval, on this interval, uh, the, the second derivative is positive. See, I, what I was thinking was at the actual value of negative square root of one third. So still, you know, n nothing uh, terribly interesting except for that we do need to know what the concavity is on this interval because this is going to be on the left of this zero of the first of the second derivative. So um, we will now look at the actual value of the negative square root of one third. Okay. Um, original function, if there is a point of inflection, it'd be pretty useful to know exactly where that is. So uh, maybe we should go ahead and enter that in. Just come up here and uh, enter that function in. It'll just be easier. So I'm going to make this not graph. Okay, so the original function was x plus 4 over x squared plus 1. Nope, that's not what I want. X squared plus 1. Okay, and then we'll just look at the table and, and plug in this negative square root of 1 third. And we get something that's really small. 2.4226. Um... So that's what the original function is, and so we can put that in there. Uh, and I've forgotten already. 2.4226. So we'll just say 2.4. We just really need kind of an idea. Um, the derivative, hmm, it's still got to be positive. It can't possibly switch uh, slopes until 0.129. What's the second derivative? It's zero. We have this possible point of inflection. Does it switch from, well, positive to negative? Well, we need to look at the next uh, a point in the uh, following interval to find out. So we're going to go from the negative square root of one-third uh, up until, um, let's see, uh, this has been used. Um, we haven't used the positive square root of one-third yet and we haven't used 0.129 or 1.608. So I wonder if the square root of one-third uh, is, is bigger or smaller than 0.129 or possibly exactly the same. Let's see. Um, the square root of one-third. No, the square root of one-third is 0.577. So it's definitely bigger than 0.129. So we will, um, the calculator won't go away we will go to 0.129 because that's where we're going to find possibly an uh, uh, extrema. Um, so we, we wouldn't say anything about the function on the interval, you know, the actual values of the function. We might say something about the derivative. The derivative uh, up and to this point is going to be positive. And the second derivative here, now we need to look at what's the value of the second derivative um, at um, Oh, sorry, we got 0.129. Um, so on that interval, um, oh, we need to look at a, a test point between negative root of one third and 0.129, uh, which is, uh, well, we could put zero in there. That's definitely in that interval, and that'd be very simple. So, um, hey, look at that. Uh, so we'll look at the second derivative and we'll put in zero. We got zero here, so we have one squared, that's one, that's negative eight here. Negative eight. And this is going to be zero, right? Because we multiply, here's a factor of x, and so it's going to make this whole thing zero. So we have negative eight. Um, 
And then down here we have uh, 0 plus 1, that's 1. 1 to the fourth is 1, so 8 over 1. Negative 8 over 1 is negative, so yes, the second derivative is negative, which allows us to go back here to this possible point of inflection and confirm that's a point of inflection. That point of inflection is at negative square root of 1 third, uh, comma 2.4. Um, so that was the really important part about that. Uh, here it's concave up, here it's concave down. Other than that, um, we don't really have uh, more information uh, about that. Uh, so, we will now look at uh, the actual value of 0.129. That's the right side of this interval. What's going on there? Uh, well, the, the original function, we could look at what the value of the original function is. You can put in 0.129 and get 4.0635. Uh, 4.06. Um, and what's the first derivative doing? That's why this point is interesting, 0.129. It's a zero of the first derivative. It's possibly an extreme, a max or a min. So how can we tell? It's really super convenient uh, to look at the second derivative. If it has a slope of zero, slope of zero, horizontal slope, as I'm gesturing here on the right here, uh, and it's concave down, then we know we have a maximum. If it's concave up and there's a slope of zero, we know we have a minimum. So let's look at um, what the second derivative is doing. Of course, it's not going to um, switch concavity from negative to anything else until possibly square root of one third. So it's still negative. So it's concave down, slope of zero, so we have a max. Then we'll continue from 0.129 to the square root of 1 third. That's because the square root of 1 third is definitely going to come before 1.608. Um, so on the interval, we wouldn't say anything about the values of the function itself. Um, we could start talking about the, uh, the first derivative. So between 0.129 and the square root of 1 third, which I know between there is a half. So we could put a half into the first derivative and here is the first derivative so um, and it really just matters if it's positive or negative so um, we're gonna put in one half so eight times a half is four um, and then a half squared is one fourth plus one that's gonna be five fourths squared that's gonna be twenty five sixteenths um, so four over 25 sixteenths, what matters here is that it's, or negative 4 over 25 sixteenths. Um, and then, let's see, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. So 4 times 16 over 25, that's going to be 64 over 25. So that's 1 minus 64 over 25, which is negative. That's the point. The slope is negative. No big surprise there, right? Because we found that this was a maximum. So if this is, these are positive slopes here and negative slopes here and a zero slope in between, of course, that's what we would have to see if this is a max, which we already confirmed that it was. Um, and we can look at um, the second derivative. It hasn't switched concavity yet. It must still be concave down uh, to have a, a negative. Um, so that doesn't tell us anything in particular about this interval. But we do need to know on these intervals about the first and second derivative in order to find points of inflection and extrema sometimes. All right, and then we'll look at the value of the square root of one third. Um, the actual function, let's go ahead and put in the square root of one third. Five point one five, yeah, five point one five. Um, we can look at the first derivative. It uh, is not going to, you know, go from being negative to positive until it gets one point six zero eight, possibly. So it still must be negative. Um, so at this point, though, um, the second derivative is zero. 
So is it a point of inflection? We'll have to look at the concavity on the other side of that point to find out. Um, so we, we would like to write point of inflection here, but we need to look at the, uh, the value of the second derivative right here um, on this interval from the square root of 1 third up until 1.608. We wouldn't say anything about the values of the function on that interval. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can move this up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the first derivative, we could say up until 1.608 is still going to be negative. Um, so what's the second derivative then at, on this interval? And we know that between the square root of 1 third and 1.608 is 1. So that's going to be... Uh, probably the best thing to plug in here. Um, so let's see if we could pull out the calculator. Help us work out this. Get out of that screen. So I have a 1, so we got 1 plus 1. That's going to be 2 squared. That's 4. Negative 8 times 4 is negative 32. So I'll just jot that down. Um, oh, here, let's, let's go down here. So then we have 32. Um, 32 times x squared. Put one in there. That's going to be, uh, you know, one. Okay. Then we multiply. We're going to multiply that by one squared. That's one plus one. That's okay. So that's two. So multiply that by two. Uh, so so far in the numerator we have 32, and we're going to divide that by one plus one to the fourth. That's going to be one. So 32 over one, which is 32. So it's positive. And so, indeed, it did switch from concave down to concave up, so this is a point of inflection. Okay. Last actual point is going to be 1.608. Um, and um, the actual value of the function, uh, we can figure out what that is. We should do that, so we'll go to the table again up here and put in 1.608 press enter 2.72 2.72 uh, and let's see if we've got uh, oh right uh, so the the reason we have uh, we're, that we're investigating 1.608 is because the first derivative is 0 at that point right? Um, we'd like to know if it's a, a maximum or a minimum. Uh, the the first derivative, or sorry, the second derivative is done, right? Switching from negative to positive or vice versa, so it must just continue to be concave up. So this must be a minimum. Okay, so let's uh, throw down some axes and graph this thing uh, with green. Uh, so we talked about how we have a slant asymptote at y equals x. So that's my best y equals x, right? So it goes through the origin up 1 and over 1. That's the slope. Um, let's come along here. It's concave up, uh, up until negative 1.38, where we have an x-intercept. So at negative 1.38, we have an x-intercept. So it's got a positive slope. It's concave up. So it must be going like this, just gradually for a long time. OK. And then uh, we come along, still concave up. And then, oh, we have a point of inflection at uh, negative square root of 1 third, comma, 2.4. So the negative square root of 1 third is about a half. It's a little more than a half. Uh, and then we go up to 2.4. So right about here, we have a switch in concavity. So that's a little bit, maybe I should have drawn it a little more like this. You know, it's just really gradual. And then it comes up here, and at that point starts to, you know, decrease its uh, its slope. Um, okay, so we have that point of inflection right there. Uh, after that, we see we come along this maximum at 
uh, 0.129, 4.06. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4.06. Not very big. 0 0.129, not very big. So just barely over here. So we start to curve down and go through there, and it's a maximum. Um, and then we're going to come, come, uh, come upon a point of inflection at square to one third, 5.15. So square to one third, that's about a half. Uh, and 5. Point, let's see, and 5.15. Uh, let's see, how does that work? 5.15. That doesn't seem right. It just it doesn't seem right because we're supposed to have a maximum right there. Uh, okay, it should have been 3.57, 3.58. So uh, where did that come from? I don't know. Uh, so 3.58 and one half. It's about right here. So really, it really cuts down sharply at that maximum. Okay, then there's a point of inflection. Starts to point upward. Probably coming upon a minimum here soon, and we are at 1.608. So here's 1.608 comma 2.72, 12.72, right about there. So we start to curve up and hit this minimum, and then since it's a minimum, we must increase without bound along this slant asymptote like that. Okay. Maybe the longest problem you've ever done in your whole life. Uh, but it is quite a math burger. And uh, all those points being found, uh, everything working out the way it should, you go ahead and graph it on your calculator. Confirm that you did it right. Um, I hope you agree with me that it's satisfying to, um, to know this much about a graph, to be that uh, knowledgeable about it. Uh, for instance, um, to know that since we have a max here, this value of 5 point whatever it was couldn't have been right because that maximum was there at 4.06, and so 5 is bigger than that, and how could that happen? And so we need to go back and, uh, and fix that. Um, but uh, I hope you celebrate with me that that was pretty much the only mistake uh, that I can remember, but I'm easy at blocking out my mistakes. Um, so I hope that one was helpful. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do one or two more, just uh, a cuz. So uh, I'm going to go back up here where I should be and get rid of all that. And do number 30. So number 30 looks like this. Right, so we want to know um, from this uh, some possible x-intercepts that we could have of this function. Um, so we're going to set this function equal to 0. 3x uh, to the 4th minus 6x squared plus 5 thirds equals 0. I'm really tempted to multiply everything by 3 here so that we get the denominator out of there. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. We get 9x to the 4th minus 18x squared plus 5 equals 0. Then I want to factor this guy. I really would like to do that, so I'm going to give that a shot. So uh, it, I'm going to try and factor it because it's in quadratic form. Uh, and maybe you remember this, maybe you don't, but uh, in pre-calc we talked about how to factor a quadratic that has uh, something other than 1 as the leading coefficient. So we take 9 times 5, that's 45. And then we just take this middle term, b, right here, negative 18. Uh, we look for two numbers that multiply to 45 and add to negative 18. So we're going to have to have a positive and a negative. Um, let's see. So No, we're going to have to have two negatives. Two negatives. So 15 and 3, yes. Uh, 
works. And then we take these two numbers and, and we rewrite negative 18 as the sum of negative 15 and negative 3. So 9x to the fourth minus 15x minus 3x plus 5 equals 0. And then we factor by grouping and we take out a 3x. Yeah, 3. Oh, sorry, this should be squared. Uh, squared, squared. So we take out a 3x squared from here and we get x squared minus uh, 5. And from these we could take out a negative 1, right, just so that this, this guy's positive. So we get, uh, let's see, this should be a 3x squared. Uh, and then we have a 3x squared again, minus 5. Okay, and this all equals 0. And we have a common factor here of 3x squared minus 5, so we'll factor that out. Uh, and then we have a, what, 3x squared minus 1. Um, and now we solve for x. This set this equal to 0, and we'll find that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5 thirds. And here x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 third. All right, so we are going to most likely have x-intercepts there. Um, we could also look at, you know, what's, what is the function going to do as x goes to infinity? Well, this is, this is a, a quartic, right, a degree 4. It's going to go off to infinity, uh, and, you know, both ends are going to go up uh, because we have a, a positive leading coefficient and an even degree. Uh, so those are our x-intercepts and, um, and, and our end behavior. So we could come over and look at the first derivative. So that's going to be 12x to the third minus 12x uh, and plus 0, right? Um, right? And we want to know where that is equal to 0. So 12x cubed minus 12x equals 0. Um, we could divide both sides by 12, and so we'll get x cubed minus x equals 0, we get x times x squared minus 1 equals 0, x equals 0, and x equals plus or minus 1. So we have possible extrema at these places. Um, then we can look at the second derivative. Uh, that's going to be 36x squared minus 12. We'll set that equal to 0. We get 3x squared minus 1 equals 0, uh, and x equals plus or minus the square root of 1 third. And you'll notice, hey, that's the same as these x-intercepts. So maybe these x-intercepts are also uh, possible points of inflection. Um, so we'll move down here, keeping all those values in sight, and start our little chart there. Okay. And I'll confess, I was looking at the, the solutions just to make sure I was doing everything right, and of course I was. Uh, it's not Friday today, so I shouldn't be so cocky. Oh, but it is the last day of the working week, so I think it, it is okay. Um, then we'll look at f prime and f double prime. Um, so what I was saying was that uh, they don't include x-intercepts in their little chart, and I guess they don't even look at x-intercepts at all. So, um, you know, to save room on your little chart, you could you could leave out the x-intercepts. It's a bit of a trivial thing to put on here. This is, I guess, more importantly, we want to look at um, points of inflection and extrema. That's really going to be um, the most useful thing. X-intercept, you know, it's going to go through there if you have all your other points correct. Anyway, so we're going from negative infinity up until uh, we could do um, what negative uh, square root of five thirds. That would be uh, the most left thing, um, but we would just we know we would just wind up with an x-intercept there, uh, nothing more. So uh, when we just go to negative one, um, we wouldn't say anything about the values of, of f on an interval, but the values of f prime maybe we would. Um, those values from negative infinity to negative one. Uh, so we got to pick a test interval or a test point like at negative two. Put negative two in here. We'll get um, 
negative 8, 12 times negative 8. I'm already out of my depth here. Times negative 8. Negative 96. Um, and we have uh, negative 2 again, so then negative 2 times negative 12 is uh, positive 24, so we'll add 24 to that. We can see it's going to be negative, so it's negative. So we know it's, uh, it's going down, it's got a, a negative slope. Uh, the uh, first derivative, when we put a negative 2 here, that's going to be clearly positive. So it's, you know, it's concave up and its, it's slope is positive, it's increasing. But at negative 1 at x equals negative 1. Um, the function, we should figure out what that is, what the actual value of the function is. Um, uh, negative 1, let's see, we've got 3, and then negative 1, so we've got 3 minus 6, that's negative 6, or 3 minus 6 is negative 3, plus 5 thirds, um, negative 3 plus 5 thirds, let's do a little work down here, uh, negative 9 thirds plus 5 thirds is negative uh, 4 thirds. So negative 4 thirds. So we know where to actually plot that point. Uh, F prime is 0 at negative 1. And F double prime, uh, well, it was positive here. Uh, it must still be positive here because it won't possibly change concavity or change its value until it c crosses through a 0, which is at negative uh, square root of one third, which is uh, to the right of negative one, so it's still positive. So it's concave up, and here we have a slope of zero, so we know we have a minimum. All right. So moving on to the next interval from negative one until um, the next thing, which is the square root, negative square root of one third. Okay. Now this doesn't seem like it would be very important, except for we're coming up on a zero of the second derivative, which might be a point of inflection, which means we need to know what the second derivative is uh, on the left of that value. So we didn't say anything about this. Uh, this, since it's a minimum, we had negative uh, slopes here, we must have switched over to positive slopes. Uh, this is proof of that. Um, and so we know that the second derivative is zero. To find out if that's a point of inflection, of course, look what I've done again on this interval is positive here. Uh, this, it's an interval. Um, so when we actually get to the value of the negative square root of one third, um, we could say what is the original function. We put in this the negative square root of one third. So let's just uh, go in here. I'm going to clear out all of these functions and have three x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 5 thirds um, and then look at the value of that function at the negative square root of 1 third so negative square root of 1 third center there so 0 hey look how smart I am we already found that that was true here at this at this x-intercept. So at zero, um, and the first derivative must still be positive. And now this is zero. Is it a point of inflection? Now we have to look to the right to look on this interval from the negative square root of one third to the next interesting value, which would be zero. Um, we wouldn't say anything about that. We would say this is positive still. And this is now, let's tech, uh, you know, pick a, a test point. Um, let's see, negative 1 fourth, right? It's not really great. Um, negative 1 fourth, uh, we're going to, um, you know, multiply that by itself. It's really, really small. We're going to get this really small uh, number times 36. Right, it's going to be 1 over 16, so 36 divided by 16 minus 12. That's got to be negative, and it is negative 9.75. So uh, negative, negative second derivative. So this must have been a point of inflection. 
Next, we'll actually look at the x value of 0. When we put 0 into the original function, let's see if we get 5 thirds. We get a slope of 0, and we get a, uh, a second derivative that's negative, so we must have a maximum. Right? That whole thing was the second derivative test. Uh, then from 0 to the square root of 1 third, what's going on there? This is going to set us up to maybe find a point of inflection at the square root of 1 third. We don't care about that. Uh, we must switch uh, slopes from positive to negative since we were just at a maximum. And the second derivative is at this point negative. Then we actually go to the value of the square root of 1 third. Um, and we get uh, what, 0? We found that already. Um, we go here, the slopes must still be negative. Here, the, sl the uh, second derivative is 0, possibly a point of inflection. To find out for sure, we have to go to the right of that interval, or the right of that, that point. So from 1 third, and we don't have anything else that we're interested in after that. Remember I said we were going to leave x-intercepts out of this little chart. Um, so we look and look and look, and we find that on this interval, we don't really want to say anything about that. The slopes must still be negative. And the second derivative, when we put in a value that's bigger than 1, so we can put anything in here that we want. So anything, you know, let's put 75 in here. Square 75, multiply by 36, subtract 12. That's not going to do anything. So we know that it's going to be positive. So this must have been a point of inflection. So real quickly, since my next class is about to start, and I don't want the bell on this recording. Um, we know the end behavior is going to be something like going up here forever and up here forever. We don't need to draw that out. Uh, we could put our, um, our x-intercepts in here. Negative square root of 5 thirds. Let's see, 5 thirds, a little bigger than 2. So the square root is going to be between negative 1 and 2. Uh, so maybe here and at positive square root of 5 thirds, so uh, possibly over here, you know, approximately uh, negative square root of 1 third, positive square root of 1 third. We have x-intercepts. Um, so we come along a minimum at negative 1 comma negative 4 thirds. So negative 1, negative 4 thirds. Okay. Uh, then we have a point of inflection at negative square root of 3, 0. So this is actually a point of inflection as well. Then we come up on a maximum at 0 and 5 thirds. 0 comma 5 thirds. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 thirds. There's a maximum there. There's a minimum down here. There's a point of inflection here. There's another point of inflection here. There's a switch in concavity here. We have a minimum. Uh, let's see, we have a, a, a max. And then... Oh, we missed it, didn't we? We missed positive 1. Um, I guess we should have said 1. Um, yeah, that's what we should have done. And then at the value of 1, what's going on? Um, I can tell you that it's going to be have the same x value as negative 1, so negative 4 thirds. We've got the derivative is 0. We've got the second derivative is positive, so we must have another minimum over here at uh, oh, over here at positive one comma negative four thirds. Uh, so there's a minimum, and then an x-intercept, and we have a uh, point of inflection here, point of inflection minimum, and then nothing else. You know, makes it change directions after that, so it must look like that. Okay, um, so yeah, I know those two problems took a long time. For one, I was talking them all, all the way out. Um, once you get better at these, um, you'll be able to just pull all this information out real quickly, and test all these points. Maybe use your calculator to find out if these are positive or negative, and find out what these values are. Do those really quickly, um, and it's just it really takes you to a depth of understanding. Um, that's beyond that of someone who thinks it's a waste of time. Um, we can draw pretty, I think, incredibly accurate graphs with not that many points, right? Without even the x-intercepts, uh, we could draw a pretty accurate graph knowing where the points of inflection are, where the maxes and mins are, and knowing that the end behavior has to be 
what it is. I mean, we don't even have to know about the end behavior. We know that there's a minimum here, and then there's never anything else. There's not a maximum. There's no undefined. There's nothing else. It just has to keep going and never turn around, and so it just must keep on going for infinity. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can write a comment. You can uh, send me a, a Gmail, uh, whatever, and uh, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.